runs in my family, and it goes by the name of laughter. My sister and I are both afflicted. In the face of catastrophe, we do not shout or cry or hyperventilate or leap into helpful action. Instead, we laugh. Unstoppable, hysterical, body-quaking laughter. Through the years, it has been explained to us that laughter is not an entirely uncommon stress response, but I confess that, as personality quirks go, this can be a socially awkward one. I have laughed in the immediate aftermath of a car accident, of being caught in a lie, of getting a phone call filled with a cold shock of bad news. I have laughed my way through fights and breakups and hospital visits and kitchen mishaps that result in blood. <laughs> Several years ago, the New York Times Book Review reviewed a story collection called American Innovations by a writer named Rivka Galchin. The reviewer quoted from a story in which a mother decamps to Mexico City, leaving behind her husband and daughter. At one point, the mother resists asking after her daughter while on the phone with her husband, telling herself that, quote, I knew that would just seem defensive, probably even be defensive, seeing as I felt pretty sure about how she was doing. Children, I remember this from my own experience, are, I think, very resilient, and one you shouldn't let people tell one otherwise." End quote. The reviewer followed this passage with a question, is it plausible that a mother would feel this way? The question was a clear rhetorical, the answer an obvious no. An assemblage, by no means exhaustive, of recent news headlines concerning mothers. Need a mom? Now you can rent one for $40 an hour. Meet the Insta mom, a stage mother for social media. Mesa police identified mother, son in murder suicide at children's hospital. Woman accused of endangering ailing son by fleeing to Pennsylvania. Mother tricks police officers with fake court order. Girl three left in liquor store as mom scrambled to stash boyfriend's gun. She might have gotten away with poisoning her husband if not for one spelling mistake. Florida woman hires hitman to kill man who gave her grandkids lice. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen in Florida. I'm from there, so, so I'm allowed to say that. In a recent essay entitled Highly Unlikely, Venda La Vida observed that we've arrived at a point where not only is reality stranger than fiction, but we don't allow our fiction to be even close to how strange real life is every day. This double standard has consequences. Authors self-edit making their fiction less bizarre than their own lives, than life itself, for fear that their plots will be deemed unbelievable. The fact that we, as readers and writers, don't seem to allow our fiction to be as strange as our reality is, well, strange." End quote. Strange is, of course, a subjective and multifarious term. The definition depends entirely on who you're asking. One person's bizarro might be a different person's normal, and vice versa. As a Floridian, I can attest to the subjectivity of what constitutes strange, but I take Vita's point to go something like this. The world is filled with people who process its happenings in alarming and inexplicable ways. We all know this. Yet on the page, it can be strikingly difficult to embrace true unconventionality when it comes to our characters, to not smooth the psychological edges in the name of palatability or likability or nervousness around credibility, perhaps driven by the worry that a reader might ask of our story about, say, two sisters who laugh maniacally at the most inopportune moments imaginable, <laughs> is it possible a person would laugh maniacally in the immediate aftermath of a car accident? Yet when it comes to writing emotionally and psychologically unconventional characters, especially those who are unconventional in the extreme, half measures and tentativeness tend to open doors to readerly doubt, as opposed to deepening conviction. 
Truth is stranger than fiction, in other words, but it is the business of fiction to embrace some of the strangeness of truth.